In August 1987, a body was found under a highway by a boy walking his dog in the town of Bernadston in the state of Massachusetts. The body belonged to 47-year-old Joy Separo, who had been missing for a few days. She was in her nightgown, had a yellow towel over her mouth and a pair of pantyhose around her neck that was used to strangle her. Everything suggested that it was a kidnapping gone wrong. As Joyce was 105 kilometers from her home in Glastonbury, Connecticut. The police thought that the kidnappers would take her into captivity, but something went wrong along the way and they decided to kill her. It was then that the investigations began. Bernardston police had already located Joyce's car in a creek without the license plates a few days earlier. When they went to her house, the only strange thing was that the front door was unlocked. However, there was no sign of a struggle and nothing broken in the house that could look like she was taken by force. The first person the police spoke to was Joyce's boss, Mike Sicaro. He was the one who made the identification of the body and talked about Karen Aparo, who was Joyce's daughter at the time, 16 years old, when the police asked if he knew any close relatives of Joyce. The police then went after Karen to report that they had located her mother's body. Karen was in the house of the Murkoff family, a family of violinists who taught her lessons. And as they lived far, it was common for the girl to sleep at their house when she took violin lessons. By the time the police arrived at the Murkoff house, everyone was there. So they asked to talk to Karen and told her that her mother had been murdered. According to one of the police officers, Karen was extremely pale. She said she did not believe that this had happened. The police officers asked Karen if she had any idea who could have done this to her mother. She said no and that her mother had no enemies. The police then returned to Joyce's house to do a thorough forensics for clues. As they had seen before, there was no sign of breaking or sign of fight in the house. Whoever entered there had easy access to the house or knew very well how to open a lock without damaging it. The police officers went to Karen's room, which was untouched. Everything was very well organized and had nothing suspicious or even out of place. The police even commented that it was a very tidy room for a teenager. Joyce's room, however, was all messed up, as if someone had looked for something and rushed out of there. The police also talked to the neighbors, but none of them saw anything strange that could help with the investigations. They then decided to talk to Joyce's co-workers, some of whom said that Joyce was known for being very strict and having a very short temper. Joyce's boss, Mike Sicaro, said that he thought a lot about what could have happened to her and that the night before, he remembered an event that happened a few days ago that could be linked to her murder. He said that a few days before she had been in an accident and told him that the car was not safe and asked for other. However, he told her that it was not possible to get another car because of the company's contract. According to him, she was furious and told him to decide or else she would find a way to get rid of the car. The police then came up with a theory that Joyce could have hired a criminal to get rid of the car for her and that for some reason the criminal ended up killing her. But soon that did not hold up and the police followed another line of investigation. They then went to talk to Joyce's ex-husbands, starting with Karen's father, Michael Aparo. Michael worked for a Catholic charity organization. He was married to Joyce for 10 years. Before they met, he wanted to become a priest, but according to him, he fell in love and decided to marry her. Michael told the police that their 10 years of marriage were hell. The choice was extremely manipulative and that she mocked his faith whenever she could and that after the breakup, she tried her best to keep his daughter away. The police realized that Michael had a motive to kill Joyce and then they decided to investigate further. They started collecting statements from friends and close relatives and every one of them said the same thing. They say that Michael was a very peaceful man and that he couldn't have done something like that to Joyce. Even though she was mean to him, did everything she did and also tried to push her daughter away. After collecting a lot of information about Michael, they continued their investigations. They located another ex-husband of Joyce, Peter Thoreau, who was married to her for over two years. Peter told the cops that she was a liar, manipulative and controlling and that after they split up, she moved out and told all her new friends that he killed himself because of her. The cops collected all the information they needed about Peter and then asked him where he was the night she was murdered. 
Peter was eventually dismissed as a suspect because he was able to prove that that night he was far away from the crime scene. The police then decide to talk to Joyce's third ex-husband and Karen's ex-stepfather, John Davis. He said basically the same things about Joyce, that she was a compulsive liar, manipulative, and that nothing was ever good enough for her. He also said that when they parted, Joyce began to spread to all his relatives and friends that he was an alcoholic and a homosexual. John said that he got along very well with Karen and that he felt sorry for the girl. According to him, Joyce was extremely controlling, manipulative and aggressive with her daughter and that once he tried to intervene when she was hitting Karen. However, it was even worse and that ended up resulting in their separation because he could no longer take it. With all this information about Joyce's troubled relationship with her daughter, the cops decided to call Karen at the police station to ask her some questions. Karen had been living with her boyfriend, Dennis Coleman, since her mother's death. Dennis was 19 years old. He met Karen in June 1986 in the parking lot of the condominium where they lived. The police started asking Karen if her mother liked Dennis. Karen said yes. Unconvinced, the officer said that according to what they knew about her mother's personality, she wouldn't be at all satisfied with their relationship. Even more so for the fact that Dennis wasn't in college and wasn't from a wealthy family either. Karen was nervous and the police noticed it. Annoyed, she told them that her mother didn't meddle in her affairs. The cops told her they knew that that was a lie. She became even more irritated and said that she could not be kept at a police station against her will and that she wanted to leave. The cop said she could go home whenever she wanted. They even offered her a ride. She refused and said she just wanted to use the phone to call someone to pick her up. They then showed her where the phone was. Karen's strange attitude made the cops very suspicious. And to top it off, when she went to use the phone, she called her boyfriend and started asking him strange questions, like if he had cleaned it up right, if he had left something behind, or if he had forgotten something. Right in the next room, there was a policewoman who heard everything. As soon as Karen got off the phone, the policewoman went to talk to the other cops about what she had heard. The cops quickly went after her before she left in order to interrogate her. When Karen was back in the station, the cops asked her about who she had called. Immediately, she said it was her boyfriend, Dennis. They then asked her what they had talked about, and she said she was only asking for a ride. The cops then repeated to her everything the policewoman had heard when she was on the phone. Karen was shocked and terrified. And right then, Karen's boyfriend arrived at the police station to pick her up. At that very moment, the cops take her into another room and tell Dennis that they need to ask him some questions. The first question was how long they had been together and how was Dennis' relationship with her mother. Dennis, a little bit nervous, said they had been together for a year or so and his relationship with Joyce was normal. The next question was about Joyce's approval of their relationship. He talks back and later says she approved. They also asked him if he had the house keys, given that whoever entered the house didn't have to break in. Dennis said he did and then they asked him when was the last time he was in the house. He said it was the day before Joyce's death and that he only used the key to feed the cats when no one was home. At this point, the cops were very suspicious, especially because of Dennis' behavior who showed to be extremely nervous. Dennis asked them if he could go, explaining he had an appointment. The cops say it is okay and let him go. With the new information they got from Karen and Dennis, the cops decided to go to their school and talk to their principal and their teachers. Both the principal and the teachers said the same things about them, that they were good students and never had any problems at school. However, they also mentioned the fact that Joyce, Karen's mother, was a very difficult person to deal with. One of the teachers even said that Joyce was insufferable and that when Karen got low grades, she would cry and beg them not to tell her mother or else she would be punished. Some other teachers even said that they often noticed some bruises on Karen when she was younger and that she'd already tried to cure herself by taking several pills from her mother and didn't die because she was taken to the hospital in time. And Joyce not only didn't support her daughter but got furious and had to be restrained by security because she tried to attack her. Right after Karen tried to take her own life, 
a psychiatric evaluation of Joyce and her daughter was requested. Joyce's assessment concluded that she was hysterical, aggressive, cruel, and that she wanted to control her daughter's life as much as possible. Karen showed that she felt trapped, controlled, had a great need for her mother's approval, and that at the same time was very angry. A few days went by since Karen and Dennis had been at the police station, and surprising the police, Karen came back with a lawyer. She told the police Dennis didn't go to her mother's funeral and called her later, telling her he had done it and left her a note by the bed, saying, I'll do the job, my dream girl. The police asked Karen if Dennis had told her the reason why he had killed her mother. She said that according to Dennis himself, he wanted them to be together forever without her mother in between them because he knew her mother would never approve of the two of them being together. The police went straight to Dennis' house. Once there, what they tell him is that they need him to go to the station for a few more questions. Seem to be scared, he agrees to go and tell them he needs to get his wallet first. The cops then offer to go with him. As soon as they enter Dennis' room, the cops are surprised by the amount of photos of Karen all over the room, photos on the walls, on the furniture, on the doors, photos all over the place, like it was a kind of sanctuary for his girlfriend. That was then, the cops noticed how obsessed Dennis was with Karen. It was clear that he'd be able to do anything to keep her, including killing. Dennis was taken back to the police station, and that was then, they start trying to get a confession. They tell him they know he killed Joyce and that Karen had told them everything. Dennis was extremely confused and didn't seem to believe the cops. He didn't believe Karen could have turned him in. The cops tell him they found the note he left for Karen and then asked him the meaning on the message he'd left on the note. At first, Dennis wobbles and says it was something about a doctor. Then he went back on his word and says it had something to do with the cats he fed at Karen's house. The cops then started pressuring him by saying that they knew about Joyce's personality, that she was abusive to Karen and that she was extremely controlling and that she would never let them be together. Dennis realizes he can't deny it anymore, and so he confesses. The motive he gives was that he proposed many times to Karen that she would run away with him to a place where her mother couldn't find them. Karen never said yes because she was too afraid of her mother. He told them about a time when he was at Karen's house. He found her diary and read a few pages where Karen had written about the physical and psychological abuses committed by her mother and confessed she was thinking about taking her own life. Dennis claimed he was terrified about it. He was afraid of Karen's taking her own life, losing her forever because of Joyce. He then confesses. He said he had done it all by himself in order to save Karen from her cruel mother. Dennis is arrested and the police closes the case. However, a few days later, Dennis called the police, saying he had important information about the crime. The investigators are interested in knowing what information he had about it. Dennis, right away, said that Karen knew all about it and that she was a part of it since the beginning, that she had found out about her mother's life insurance, an amount of $3,100. That money, according to her, would be her ticket to freedom. Dennis went even further by saying that Carrie had insisted for over a year that he would kill her mother and that she was the one who planned it all. Also, that Karen wrote him letters in which she said that everything would be okay and that if things went wrong and he went to jail, she would stand by him no matter what. And in reality, once Dennis went to prison, Karen didn't speak to him anymore and he felt abandoned by her. Given the new information, they reopened the case. Police goes to Karen and Dennis' house. They search and find the letters and diaries she wrote him. And then, everything's taken as evidence. One of the letters said the following. I really believe we're gonna be fine. Even if we both have to spend 25 years in jail. Although I don't think so. If the worst happens, I promise I'll do my best for you. I will write letters. I'll send cookies. Cakes. Breads. Christmas cards books and crosswords. And yes, I'll visit you whenever I can. God will be with you, Dennis. Otherwise, we'll be together in hell forever. In addition to discovering that Dennis was telling the truth about Karen, they also discovered two other accomplices, Kara Littner, 16 years old, and her boyfriend, Christopher Wheatley, age 19, both of whom were friends with Karen and Dennis. 
and even helped him get rid of Joyce's body. In the diary, the police also discovered that Karen was sleeping with Alexander Markov, the son of her violin teacher, and also that she even wrote down the number of times she had sex with him. Karen and the other two accomplices were arrested. The news was spread quickly throughout the United States, as the media had been following the case from the beginning. With this turn of events, the population is very divided about Karen. To blame or not to blame? Some thought she manipulated Dennis into killing her mother so she could keep Alexander Markov and the insurance money. Some others believe Dennis is lying and wants to harm Karen since she walked away from him after he was arrested. Alexander Markov was also investigated over his relationship with Karen. However, it was soon proved that he was not involved in Joyce's murder. Karen, Dennis, Kyra and Christopher went to trial. Dennis pleads guilty to the murder charge and faces 34 years in prison. Kyra and Christopher make a deal with the prosecution in exchange for more information about the crime. And just like that, both of them are never sentenced to prison. Karen is indicted for conspiracy and associated with the murder. However, she is acquitted by the jury. In court, when she heard from the judge who was acquitted, she went to the people in the jury crying and greeted one by one that they had saved her life. Karen's defense always used the argument that she was a victim, that her mother was extremely cruel and that Dennis manipulated her, not the opposite. Defense's strategy worked and managed to convince the jury and even with all the evidence the police had gathered that ended up proving that Karen did plan her mother's murder, she was exonerated. This controversy trial revolted many in the country. There were several requests that the case was reopened and for Karen Aparo faced trial again. Of course, it never happened. Karen currently lives in Missouri. She is married and works only in a nursing home for the elderly. Dennis Coleman would serve his sentence until 2021. However, he had his sentence reduced due to good behavior and got off prison in April 2014. Neither of them ever talked to the media about the crime and they prefer to have a private life. This case was one of the hottest court cases in the United States. The majority of the population followed it at the time. An extremely detailed and controversy surrounded crime made it gain a lot of notoriety. It even yielded a book that was published in 1992 and a movie in 1994, both with the same title. Well, folks, that's it. Thank you so much for watching until the end. Best wishes. And I'll see you next time.